No, because it's no, no. That's after after you. Oh no, sorry. We're doing the prophetic update first. Sorry about that. So um, let's go to the prophetic update, and um, I'll just share share the screen for you to see. Did you actually see the words on the screen? Yes, we saw the words on the screen. But the music was just... Well, it was like a squeaky, scratchy sound in the background, very, very faint. And hardly, we couldn't, well, basically didn't really sound like music. It was like a squeaky, scratchy type of sound, you know, very, very mute. Okay. A very, very low sound, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, all right. Okay, we'll see. I'll have to maybe try and experiment with that sometime with one of you guys when we're not doing the presentation one day. Anyway, let's just share this screen. Okay, so today's prophetic update. So in Revelation 18 verse 23, it says, For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Revelation 18 verse 23. So what does the word sorceries actually mean? Is it, you know, like witches and wizards casting spells and turning people into pumpkins and things like that? Or is it something more serious? So in the strong importance, the word for sorceries in Greek is pharmakia. And that's basically telling you something already. Mm. Now, the meaning of pharmakia is the use of medicines, drugs, or spells. Now, in the modern terms, we would call the use of medicine and drugs pharmaceuticals. Would you agree? Okay. So I'd like to read a quote from Fifth Testimonies 451. It says this, When Protestantism shall, shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvellous working of Satan and that the end is near. Okay, so let's digest this uh, quote. So first of all, Protestantism is going to stretch its hand across, across the gulf and take the hand of the Roman power. And when this happens, America, this is speaking of America, will repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. Now, I want us to look at this word repudiate. What does repudiate actually mean? So repudiate, the first one means to refuse to accept or reject. And number two is to deny the truth or validity of. So that's what repudiate means. Now, some synonyms of, of repudiate is reject, renounce, abandon, forswear, give up, turn one's back on, have nothing more to do with, wash one's hands of, have no more truck with, not, never heard that saying before, must be American, abjure, disavow, recant, desert. Now it's interesting, I was just thinking of this, this word desert here. Now when we think of dessert sweets, it's a double S. But here it's a single S. Yet when we say that word in another word, it means we say desert. That's weird. Anyway, that's just a, it's funny, the English language. So desert, discard, disown, cast off, lay aside, cut off, rebuff, forsake, disprofess. Now, when you think of all those adjectives there or verbs there, what kind of attitude would you have to repudiate someone? Would you? Love them or hate them? You'd be hating them. <laughs> you would be hating them, right? Okay. Now, the opposite of repudiate means to embrace. Now, when you embrace something, 
usually is because you love that thing, right? You embrace it. So embracing means love. And when you embrace, it's like you're holding on to it. You never want to let it go. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, there are some words here I want us to look at in particular. Um, so first of all, refuse to accept, reject. Deny the truth or validity of. Renounce, disown, and cut off. Now, we know the word cut off means to, to um, sever or to, um, to kill because we know that um, those who did not have any participation in the Day of Atonement were cut off from the children of Israel. Okay, so with that thought in mind, let's have a look at the Jesuit oath. I'm not going to look at it all, just a couple of quotes from it. Now, it says he, supposedly the Pope, has power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal. I would say illegal, illegal would mean to deny the validity of. I would say yes, it would. Without his sacred confirmation, and that they may safely be destroyed. And then he says, I do now renounce or repudiate and disown or repudiate. So that's a double repudiation. I do now renounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince or state named Protestant or liberals or obedience to any of the laws. Now, the laws of our country, obviously, are the constitution, magistrates or officers. Then he goes on to say, I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of these, I'm not saying to say that word about him, agents or any place wherever I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, and so on, or in any other kingdom, and I've included Australia there, or territory that I shall come to, and do my utmost to extirpate. Now, what does extirpate mean? It means to kill the heretical or remove the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines and to destroy or kill all their pretended powers, regal or otherwise. So according to, to this Jesuit oath, do they repudiate the constitutions or laws of nations that have not been established by the papacy? Yes, they do. Okay. So now let's go back to this quote here. We see Protestantism stretching its hand across the gulf, the, the grass hands of the papacy. And when that happens, America and other places obviously will repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. Every principle. So, but in the meantime, some principles of the constitutions are being repudiated. But eventually, when the Sunday law comes, every principle of the constitution will be repudiated. Now, for what purpose? Oh, sorry, before we go to that, part of the Australian Constitution, part five, section 51, 23a says this. Now, this was, this, what we're going to read now, was introduced into the, or added into the constitution in 1946. It was added in as part of the Social Security Act and, um, and uh, or Social Welfare Act. And it wasn't in there before, but it was added in in 1946. Now, 1946 was directly after the Second World War. So let's just read this. It says, the provision of maternity allowances, widow's pensions, child endowment, unemployment, pharmaceutical sickness and hospital benefits, medical and dental services, but not so as to authorise any form of civil conscription, benefits to students and family allowances. Now, the point I want to bring out in this, um, this part of the constitution is this. Pharmaceutical sickness and hospital benefits, medical and dental services, but not so as to authorise any form of civil conscription. In other words, not so as to force anybody to take any pharmaceutical or medical and dental services. Okay, so it's interesting that this clause, this, this in the parenthesis, was put in there 
just after the First World War, Second World War, sorry. Now, what happened? What brought about the Second World War? It was the attack of the Germans upon the Jews and the Jew, the Germans trying to make this super race. And it led to, to um, many people, not just Jews, but especially the Jews being sent to concentration camps and so on. And in our in this constitution, the fra framers of this, this act, article, recognize that man cannot force, has no authority or no right to force pharmaceuticals or medical or dental services upon anybody because they saw what happened in Germany. Okay, now let's move on. So again, repudiate every principle of this constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. For what purpose? For the propagation of falsehoods and delusions. So when they repudiate the principles of their constitution, they are making provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Now, again, I want to look at these two words, falsehoods and delusions. Can anyone tell me what another word for falsehood and delusions might be? Deception. Deception. Okay, thank you. Deception. Now let's go back to Revelation 18, verse 23. Deceived. Would you see deceivers being deception? Yes, it is. So whose deceptions are these? It says thy. Now who is thy? Thy is, is Babylon or the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. And who were who were deceived? So sorry, there it says papal falsehoods and deceptions, delusions, sorry. So who were deceived? All the nations were deceived. And what were they deceived by? They were deceived by her sorceries, by her pharmacia, by her pharmaceuticals, her drugs, medicines, and spells, and potions, and so on. Okay. Now, we have had over the last 18 months a global pandemic or pandemic, whichever one you want to believe, with COVID-19. And now they've brought out this vaccine. Some people would like to call it other things as well. But they've brought out this vaccine. And this vaccine is encouraged, the governments of the world are encouraging you to get the vaccine. But can they force you to get the vaccine? No, they can't. Because of the clause in this constitution, you cannot be forced to get the vaccine at the moment, it seems, seems that way. But at the same time, there are certain industries that you, if you're working in those industries, you have to go and get the vaccine. So even though the government is not forcing you or fining you from getting it, they are underhandedly working around that another way by saying, if you want to work in this job, you have to go get it. So even though it seems like the government's not doing it, but the, the businesses and so on are. Okay, but with that in mind, that no, they, can, they are not forcing you to get the vaccine. But let me ask a question. Is there some, sorry, is there some medical services or appliance or appliances or apparatuses or devices that are being forced upon us that if we do not use these things, we will be fine. Is there something that's got to do with COVID that is being forced upon the people? And if they don't do this, they're going to be fine. Can you tell me what that might be? Anybody? The masks. The masks, amen. Thank you, the masks. You see here on this picture, Victorian government, you need to leave home, you need to wear a mask. If you don't wear a mask, 
you're going to get fined. And it's interesting that I I only put this together. The thought for, to put this together was a couple of days ago. But when I was at work yesterday, someone came in and told me that the day before or sometime during this week, the police, I'm not sure whether it was the Marysville police, but the police were walking around Marysville telling people, forcing people to put their masks on when they were outside. And if they didn't, they were going to get fined. So let me ask a question. Is that against this part of the Australian Constitution? Yes or no? The answer is yes, it is. People are being forced by fear of fines to wear a medical device or a medical service because of this COVID-19. Now, again, it says in the quote in the testimony, is our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant, not put Commonwealth government there. Are we repudiate through this COVID vaccine? COVID era we're having, are we repudiating some principles of our constitution as a Protestant and Commonwealth government? Yes or no? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And for what purpose? So by the sorceries of Babylon, are the nations being deceived? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes they are. Big time. And I've only touched on this point alone. Okay, so now let's go through this quote once more as we finish off. And let's read it sentence by sentence. When Protestantism shall stretch a hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, we talked about a bit, a bit about that this morning in the Sabbath school, when it came to Christian movies and, and so on like that, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican and, and Commonwealth government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Is this happening, brothers and sisters? Yes or no? And has this happened? Yes, it has, right? Yeah. What next? What is next? What does the rest of the quote say? Then may we know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. So, brothers and sisters, we are getting very near the end. We don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but we're getting very close to every principle of our constitution being repudiated and the Sunday law will come in and the end will be very near after that. Jesus said, so likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Luke 21, verse 31. So thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening to this presentation and thank God that he's given us the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to help us navigate our way through these delusions and these events that are happening in these last days. Amen. Okay. Now I'd like to um, ask Shadidu's children to uh, do their special item for us. And, and then Shelley will do her presentation. So you want to unmute yourself, girls, if you're not unmuted? Looks like they've disappeared. Are they there? Oh, there they are. Yeah. You guys unmute yourself. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, today we'll be doing a scripture song from Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2 to 4. And if everyone would like to open up their Bibles. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2 to 4. 
Exodus chapter 26, verse 2 to 4. Shall keep my Sabbaths in reverence, my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field. Shall yield the fruit. Leviticus 26, 2 through 4. Amen. Amen. Thank you, girls. Okay, now um, I welcome Shelley. I'll just share the screen for you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yeah, happy Sabbath. So our last talk was on salary juice. So who here did salary juice and what did you experience? Did anybody do any? Do any salary juice? Attempted? I didn't. Sorry, no. <laughs> you did? Uh, no, I didn't personally know. Anyone else? Uh, sorry, sir, I have not uh, done that yet. Uh, I had to get salary first. <laughs> no worries. So I did the salary juice. Um, I probably have a bit of experience, like Craig was saying. It does work your gut a little bit. Not that you're running to the toilet, but it does work. Mm. It's wonderful if you are constipated. Now, I also found too, though, that I did have more energy. So it does work. So I recommend to do it. Now, my, uh, what I'm gonna be talking on is let food be thy medicine. And that should be how it should be, shouldn't it? We should start with our food being our medicine, medicine being our food. So why lemons? Well, there's a lot of benefits of eating lemons. It helps reduce weight. It gives relief from fever and cold. It can actually soothe toothache and cleanse your teeth. It uh, eases pain of sunburn and bee stings. It even controls high blood pressure, stops internal bleeding and nosebleeds. And I found that interesting because I did not know that. It even treats rheumatism and arthritis. It cures indigestion and constipation. It can also reduce dandruff and gives your hair a shine. It also has vitamin C, 128%. It also has calcium and iron and protein. It helps fade scars and removes wrinkles and blackheads. So what is lemon essential oil used for? Well, I have an essential oil right here. I don't know if you guys can see it. This is very beneficial. We're gonna go through some of this. So lemon oil can put you in a better mood. That's very important. Soothing anxiety. I know a lot of people are having anxiety and this would be a good oil for them. And lifting the spirits. A small study on mice found that mice who inhale lemon oil vapor show decrease in symptoms of stress. It gives you healthier skin. So next time you notice hard, crusty skin on your feet, like corns or calluses or bunions, just add a few drops of lemon oil. I, what I recommend though, is to use a caring oil, like a coconut oil. If you've got athlete's feet, I'll tell you, coconut oil is amazing. I had a friend 
he had athlete's feet. And I said, put coconut oil on it. And he rubbed it on his feet. And no kidding, the next day, it was gone. So it also gives you a brighter complexion. Lemon oil can help remove dead skin cells and exfoliate. So there's a homemade exfoliate. You can do four to five drops in a small amount of oatmeal and water for a homemade scrub. Feels great. Pink Himalayan salt scrub. Who's ever made this? I've never had, but I'm gonna make this. This is, um, there's the recipe. If you guys would like the recipe, just give me, either give Michael your email or put the email in the chat box and I will send them to you. Sorry? Take a photo of it or you can take a photo of the screen if you'd like. Home uses for lemon essential oil. So stinky laundry. Who here has had their laundry stink sometimes? when you left it in too long. Hmm. Here for oozy, sappy trees. Who here has touched sap on the trees? It is so sticky. I remember trying to get it off your hands. It's very difficult, but try some lemon oil next time. Stops grease in its track. So put some lemon in your um, soap, in your dish soap. It's a great for a degreaser. Cleanses surface. Put lemon oil in your spray bottle with a little bit of vinegar and it shines things up. No mask required. No, that's not the COVID. <laughs> no mask required. You know, some chemicals are very strong when you're cleaning your shower and you don't even have to use it. Just use some lemon oil and some vinegar and it's all pure and organic. Can nourish your leathers. Preserve and prevent leather from splitting. Refreshes your silver. So, you know, when you've got um, fish cutlery, they call it silverware, uh, it can really clean it up. Remove stickiness. Now, I remember as I was a child, one time I had gum in my hair. I had to get a little bit cut off. But this time you can actually put in lemon oil. So that'd be good for the children who get gum in their hair. It can revive wood furniture. So it's beautiful and shine and prevents fine wood finishes from drying out. There is a cleans your stainless. A lot of people have stainless steel appliances. You can use uh, on the stainless. It works amazing. Spot-free dishes. Got a dishwasher. Put some in your dishwasher. It refreshes bad smelling washcloths. So that's very good to know. It also is good for body and mind. It eases respiratory issues. How important is that today? How many people are having respiratory issues? I'm not even just saying from the COVID virus, but I'm saying from any other uh, viruses. So it's good for, it slows down wheezing, colds, coughs, and upper respiratory problems. So if you have a diffuser, you know, get one. If you don't, then put some in. Scratchy and sore throat. You just put a little bit of oil in it, some water and honey. If you don't have lemon oil, you can use regular a lemon as well. Bites fungus nails, stress and nervousness. When you combine it with lavender oil and diffuse it into a room, you feel less stress, a better mood and more calm. Clear thinking and clear focus. I love being able to have that. I have so much information up in here, but to remember it, and have a clear mind would be very important to share. Take the heat out of cold sores. I did not know that. So you can put on a cold sore and feel happier. Chase away the blues with a bit of lemon oil, whether you choose to diffuse it or apply topically. Here's a one for cure acne and scars with this remedy. I haven't tried this, so I don't know, but there has been some testimonies, but you can just try it. It's all natural. And then there's one for the dandruff, which is good, and also shining your hair. So you can take a picture or give this slide. Here's another one for 10 benefits of drinking lemon water on an empty stomach. Now, who does this? This is very important. Look, it boosts your metabolism, relieves constipation, acts as a natural diuretic, prevents flu and colds. We already went through it. Reduces blood pressure, releases in 
inflammation. How many people have inflammation? I bet you every one of us have it. Improve skin health, rehydrate your entire body, promotes weight loss. So it's a kickstart to your digestion. Lemon juice encourages healthy digestion by loosening toxins in your digestive tract and gets things moving. Well, that's important. Drinking warm lemon water first thing in the morning gets your digestion system ready for the day. Detoxifies. Since lemon water activates the digestive system, this also helps to detoxify the body, which is very important to um, do de detoxification, you know, to remove toxins out of the body. It helps flush out the toxins in your body by enhancing enzyme function, stimulating your liver. Very important that we keep that liver clean because it does 900 functions. Benefit of drinking warm lemon water every morning. Lemon is one of the few foods that contain more negative charged ions. And we need more of that because we have too much positive charged ions with all our devices. It providing your body with more energy when it enters the digestive tract. The scent of lemon also has mood enhancing and energizing properties. It can brighten your mood and clear your mind. It also boosts your immune system, which we need that. Most of us know that vitamin C is good for the immune system. So vitamin C works best when it's taken in on a consistent basis. Lemons are high in vitamin C. So starting a lemon water practice is a great way to get plenty of this antioxidant without a supplement. It's fine, you can take a supplement as well if you feel sick or you're around people who are sick as well. Warm lemon water is also an effective way to diminish viral infections. Since the vitamin C in the lemon juice is also boosting your immune system, you'll simultaneously fight off the infection. It's also good for your lymphatic system and to balance your pH, which is very important for good health. Here's how you prepare your lemon water. Start with a cup of warm filtered water, not boiling hot water. Generally, it's best to avoid ice cold water since it can be a lot for your body to process. It takes a lot more to process ice cold water than it does warm water or any food or beverage for that matter. So once you use fresh lemons, okay? Not the lemon bottle. You know, you got lemon in that bottle. It's not good. Organic if possible. I know in, in Australia, we a lot of us have lemon trees. So if you don't grow one, they're easy to grow. The best way to get the most juice out of your lemon with the least amount of effort is to use a lemon squeezer. Squeeze a half a lemon in your glass and drink it down first thing and wait about 15 minutes before eating breakfast. Be sure to always dilute your lemon juice with water because lemon juice can be very hard on the enamel of your teeth. Now here's another concoction. I don't know if anybody has ever done this, but this is lemon and salt water. So you take 400 ml water, half a lemon, quarter of a teaspoon of Himalayan salt. Though these three ingredients appear relatively simple, they yield powerful results when combined and ingested first thing in the morning while you are fasted. The benefits of lemon and salt water. There are the main benefits of this morning drink. The sea salt helps neutralize the lemon. So it actually makes the lemon water less acidic for your teeth. Hydrates you more than plain water, thanks to the added nutrients. Now how it hydrates you is that the sodium takes the water into your cell and hydrates your cells um, more than just plain water. Uh, so it helps freshen your breath by killing bad bacteria in your mouth and throat. Helps jumpstart digestion and gear up your metabolism. Sounds really good. Um, hope you guys can try it and you can receive the benefits. Oh, look at that, a lemon and a grapefruit together. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> Wonder why I have that? Has anybody here been hearing about hydroxychloroquine? Yes, it's been out there. Because of this COVID-19, they say that the only remedy is the vaccine, but that's not true. God's remedy is always natural. And this is how you can make your own. You take the rind of two to three lemons, two to three grapefruits, 
take the peel only and cover it with water about three inches above the peels. Put a glass lid on your pan. one. A metal one is fine if you don't. Let it simmer for about two hours. Do not take the lid off of the pot till it cools completely, as this will allow the quinine to escape in the steam. Sweeten the tea with honey since it'll be bitter. Take one tablespoon every couple of hours to bring up the phlegm from your lungs. Discontinue as soon as you get better. Please share this with those that need to reduce fear and allow them to see that God in all of his glory provides us with all that we need. Amen. And God does, doesn't he? He has provided everything out there for us. We need to just pray and seek it and he will answer us. Now, one time we were at Lavina's place, his family, and they gave us a lemon tea with tea leaf, with lemon tea leaves. And you'll have to ask him for that recipe or I'll have to try and find it. It was, it was delicious. So I highly recommend try some lemon tea from, from the lemon tea leaves. All right, God bless, thank you. Well, thank you for that, Shelley. And um, if there's any questions on on what Shelley shared with you, like either last week or well, not last week, last program or this one, then just feel free to uh, ask after the program's finished, and um, and we she can probably give you some answers. So now I'm going to try again with another hymn, and this one is called. I surrender all. I'm just going to open it up and hopefully you can hear it. So I'm just going to share the screen. Tell me if you can hear or not when we when I start playing it, guys, brothers and sisters, I should say. So can you see it on the screen? Yes, can see it on the screen. Okay, so now I'm going to play and tell me if you can hear it. Uh, sorry, Michael, we cannot hear anything. Can you hear that? Same as before, basically. That's weird. That is really strange. Oh, oh well, for some reason, I don't know why that hap that's happening. It's some fun. Let me Let me just try again. Can you hear that? It's better, not too good, but better than it was. It sounded a bit more like music that time, but it's still not very good. I'm gonna to have to figure out why it's, why it's doing that because I don't I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand. So anyway, we'll have to skip that hymn. We'll skip the hymns. Um, we'll have to figure out how to do it properly next time. Like I said, we'll have to experiment with, with some of you, maybe you, Damien and Chris and Craig, I mean, that can help us out and maybe George. So anyway, we'll just get into our, our presentation. Okay. All right. So um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our Strange Messages sermon series. And it's sermon number three. So 
once again, we're going to look at the three angels' messages and we're going to read them from the scriptures. And it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So hopefully as we finish, we go through this year, we'll all be able to know by memory what the three angels' messages are. So these are the three angels' messages. Now, last month, we looked at the everlasting gospel. And the first part of the everlasting gospel is fear God. Oh, sorry, the everlasting gospel is actually fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So I'm going to just share a try and share another video with you. G'day. Imagine you're driving along a mountainside and you're going past a, a cliff like this, or maybe one even bigger. And as you're driving, you start seeing a, a landslide happening. What would you do? Well, you'd actually swerve your car, move your steering wheel to miss the landslide so it doesn't fall on your car and bury you. Again, imagine you're in a tunnel like this, or even in a cave, and you hear it start to rumble, and you see the rocks beginning to fall. What would you do? You try to get out of that cave as soon as you can, so the rocks don't fall on you and you die. Now, these would be the natural things to do, wouldn't they? Yet, in the Bible, we read of a group of people who do this in Revelation chapter 6, and we're reading from verses 15 to 17. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and then said to the rocks and the mountains fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand why are they saying this Isaiah 2 verse 19 gives us the answer and it says here and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth the, one of the reasons why they do this is because of the fear of the Lord. So, the message is called, today is called Fear God. And we've already seen the everlasting gospel. And the first thing the angel says is fear God. Now, when you think of the word, when people think of the word what do they usually think of? 
it brings about all sorts of bitter and hateful things come up in people's minds about him. And many hate him because of this word fear. But what does it actually mean to fear God? And that's what we're going to look at as we go through our message today. So before we do this, let's just uh, kneel for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we just come before your throne of grace this morning on your holy Sabbath day, and we thank you for your many blessings that you bestow upon us. And we thank you for your word, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray as we open up the scriptures now, and we look at what it really means to, to fear you, that you will give us wisdom and understanding and help us to recognize your desire to save each and every one of us, dear Father, and that you want us all to be in your kingdom. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Okay. So in the book of John 28, verse 28, very easy verse to remember, 28, 28, it says, And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So understanding the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And when you have this fear or this wisdom, you will depart from evil. Okay, and this is exemplified in the life of Job. In Job 1, verses 1 and 8, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was a perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed or shunned evil. And even God declared of, Sat uh, uh, declared of Job to Satan, he said, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So that was God's declaration of Job. So Job feared God and he shunned evil. Now, what is the opposite of wisdom. The opposite of wisdom is foolishness. What is one of the characteristics of a foolish man according to the word of God? We read in Psalms chapter 14. So if you want to turn there in your scriptures to Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 to 3 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. What is sad? Sorry, what a sad state of society that is. And isn't the world like this today? Quoting this psalm, Paul says in Romans 3, verse 18, that there is no fear of God before their eyes. So here we see there are two contrasting groups of people, the wise who shun evil and the fool who practice evil. What makes the difference? The answer is the wise fear God and the fool doesn't. Now, what does it mean then to have wisdom and fear God. In Psalm 111 and verse 10, we read this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. And in the next verse in Psalm 112 verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord. 
Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. And in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, 1 and 5, it says this, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And also in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So to fear God and have wisdom is to depart from evil and do his commandments. What are his commandments? In Deuteronomy 4 verse 13 we read this. And he, that's God, declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. <coughs> so God's commandments are his ten commandments. Now we will see more of these ten commandments in our next sermon as we look more into the Ten Commandments in detail. In Psalm 25 and verse 14 it says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. So those who fear God or keep his commandments, will God show his covenant? He will also show or reveal to them, or only they will understand the secret of the Lord. The things that only the wise shall understand according to Daniel 12 verse 10. And that is especially concerning the things of Bible prophecy. And it's interesting that when you understand, have a true understanding of the fear of God and an understanding of his commandments and of his covenant, then you actually have a true understanding of what the Bible prophecies are, especially in Daniel and Revelation. It, it opens up to you. But if you don't have that understanding, if you don't keep his commandments the way he wants you to keep his commandments, and you don't understand his covenant and his plan of salvation, then, then you won't understand the prophecies properly. And that's the case in the world today. We can see that with all the the other prophecies of the majority of um, apostate Christianity and their view of revelation and so on. And, and their non-understanding of the prophecies of Daniel even. Okay. <clears throat> what is the opposite of fear? The opposite of fear is found in this verse, Jeremiah 30 verse 5. We have heard the voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. So the opposite of fear is peace. Okay. Sorry. The opposite of fear is peace. Let me find where I am. Now, in this verse, we read of people trembling in fear. Usually, people tremble in fear because they are guilty of something and are afraid of getting caught. And what will be the consequences when they get caught? Or what else it is, is that as a person is being tempted to do the wrong thing, and one of the first feelings he will get is fear. He will say to himself, I really shouldn't do this. Or... What if I get caught? Why does he think like this? The reason is, is because he knows what he's going to do is wrong, is sin, is breaking the law, the Ten Commandments, and he fears the consequences. But what this really is, is the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, or the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. 
But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. In our high calling, page 153, Ellen White says this, God is ever seeking to impress our hearts by his Holy Spirit of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Also in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, it tells us that our conscience bears witness and our thoughts, meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. So, again, we know what is right and what is wrong. Normally, we know what is right and what is wrong. So the Holy Spirit will convict us of what our own personal sins are. And it also says the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits. So this thought or feeling of fear is actually the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to the heart and the mind, entreating the person not to venture into the path of disobedience. In Steps of Christ, page 49, it says, As your conscience has been quickened by the Holy Spirit, you have seen something of the evil of sin, of its power, its guilt, its woe, and you look upon it with abhorrence. As we yield to the influence of the Spirit of God, our conscience becomes tender and sensitive, and sin that we have passed by with little thought becomes exceeding sinful. So this fear or feeling, feeling of fear is an act of mercy and grace on God's part toward us so that we may not venture into sin and suffer its consequences. And it is actually part of the enmity that God put in us against Satan in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, I'm going to try and share a testimony with you again on the video. Let me briefly share with you an experience in my life that I had that teaches us this lesson. It was around the end of the 80s, 1980s, start of the 1990s, and I was at Kmart. And I was, while I was at Kmart, I was going through the CD section to look at some music to buy. And I saw this CD, and I said, I, I want to get this CD. So I grabbed that CD. And as I was walking up a little bit further up the, the section, I saw this other CD that I wanted as well. And I looked at it, and I'm thinking, I really want both of them. Which one am I going to get? And, and then a friend of mine said, why don't you buy one? And just stick the other one down your shirt or something and try and knock it off and and they they probably won't you know think you're you're trying to steal anything because you're buying one and i said nah man that's stealing i don't want to do that and, and so um i didn't so i walked off with just one cd as i was walking off you know the, the thought came i really want that other cd so i walked back and i'm holding the two of them which one am i going to buy and in the end, I decided to listen to my friend. And so I put the other one down my shirt and I was carrying the other one. And as I was walking along to the cash register, I was feeling uneasy. I was feeling, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing here. I was afraid, what if I get caught, you know, and things like that. And anyway, I was getting close to the counter and my mate said, I think you're being watched. Don't look, you know, but I think you're being watched. And so... Instead of walking to the counter, I just walked a little bit further on and I sort of glanced and I saw someone following me. And anyway, so I thought, oh, I don't want to do this, you know. I don't want to get caught stealing. And so, and I want to take the risk. So I, I went back to the CD section and I put the other CD back and walked back to the um, to the counter and bought the, the CD I was going to buy originally. Now, we didn't know whether that guy was actually following us or not. But the fear or the thought of him following me and then copying me copying it for for stealing 
brought fear into my heart and made me not want to steal. Now, if I hadn't have had that fear of getting caught in my heart, who knows what would have been the consequences of that. And my friends, I know that every one of you has had this fear of God in their hearts, perhaps even many times in your lives. Did you listen? Or did you go and commit that sin and are now in one way or another suffering the consequences of that sin, whether it be a guilty conscience or some mental or physical consequence? God pleads with you with these words. Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29. You see, friends, contrary to popular belief, God's commandments are not to bring us into bondage, but to free us. James, the apostle, says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1, verse 25. But must we keep the Ten Commandments purely out of fear of the consequences? No. That fear of the Lord is meant to work a change in our hearts and in our minds. And the Apostle John says these words. Okay. So, as I said, must we keep the Ten Commandments purely out of fear of the consequences? And obviously the answer is no. So that fear of the Lord is meant to work a change in our hearts and in our minds. And what is that change? We read in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18 these words. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So that fear of the Lord is meant to work in us and mature into us, in us, into what we call the love of the Lord. So instead of having the fear of the Lord in us, we now have the love of the Lord in us. So how does this happen? Well, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says this, We love him because he first loved us. And we see how God first loved us because it says in 1 John 4 verse 10 that herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the atonement or the substitute for our sins. And that the father sent the son, Jesus, to be the saviour of the world, 1 John 4, verse 14. So when we have God's love in our hearts, we will not have to fear to keep the law. In fact, we will say, like it says in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. We will then keep God's law because we love him not because we fear him. Amen? And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But, oh, sorry, before we go on, in Steps to Christ, page 58, it says, the things they once hated, they now love. And the things they once loved, they hate. So there's a change. A, a, the, the love of God changes us. So we no longer fear not to do those things. We no longer want to do those things. 
So we love that which Christ loved and we hate the sin which Jesus hated. Now, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 11 and 12, it says this. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and to love him. So we are to fear him and to love him. But again, that fear is no longer the fear of, of um, being afraid. It is, it is a different, it's a, more, it's a matured fear that turns into love. To love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. So, once we have a knowledge of what sin has done for us, we will not wish to do it anymore. And we will want to keep God's commandments because we love him. Now, what will this love lead us to do? 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 says this, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So this love works in us to love the children of God. And love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So the, the fear of God which transforms into the love of God, will work in our hearts to do good and to love our fellow human beings. Okay, and it will lead us to, to do good and not evil to people. So, what are some of the practical ways of fearing God? And as I was going through this, I prepared this, this sermon, maybe not 15 years ago, but 10 years ago. But, um, but these, these are some of the ways, practical ways that we are to fear God and what that fear that turns into love will lead us to do. And when we look at these things here and we look at the world today, we can see how, as I said before, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And there is no fear of the Lord before him. Because if he had the fear of God, then this, this world would not be in the case, the society, this society would not be in the state it's in today. So, you shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear thy God. So these are practical ways. We, we help people. We don't make things hard for people. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honour the face of the old man and fear thy God. So we have respect for our elders. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Is there oppression in our world today? There is so much oppression in the world today, it's not funny. And why is this? Because people have cast off the fear of God from before them and they think they can get away with it. Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. So we are not to take usury or charge interest for people and, and so on like that. And then we have this one. Thou shalt not rule him with rigour, but shalt fear thy God. And with this one, I think of the slave trade. I think of, of places like overseas where we're sending all our, all the jobs have gone overseas to China, to India, to Bangladesh and other places like that. And how do you think the people working in those places are being treated? Are they being treated fairly? Or are they being ruled with rigour? And it can be the same here with us as well. Now, Ellen White says, the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. 
He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. So again, the principle of fearing God turns into love. And when we have love, we will treat one another with the, the respect and dignity that, that human beings need to be treated with. As we looked in the Sabbath school lesson, we are created in the image of God. We are a special order of God's creation and we need to treat each other that way. Okay, let's move on. So in Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says, follow peace with all men. And remember, we look at the opposite of fear as peace. So we are to follow peace with all men. And in Romans 12, verse 18, it says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> so how do we do this? Is there peace in the world today? No, there isn't. Why is there not peace in the world today? Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Great peace are they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And in Isaiah 48, verse 14, it says, O oh, that thou hast hearkened unto my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. So people in religious faith throughout the world are searching for peace and harmony with one another. Why do they not then find it? The answer is because they do not love the law of God. Because peace can only come, or peace, one way peace comes to us is being in harmony and obedience to God's law. Now, in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, it says this, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So the reason why the professed Christian churches of the day are not blessed by God is because they are not walking in the fear of the Lord. All his Ten Commandments, as they are written in the Bible. So the churches want to have more members, and obviously that's the same with every church and, and the, the same with us. And, and the reason why that is, or the reason why it should be, is not so we got, oh, look how many people we have in our church, is because those people who come into God's church or into into the fear of the Lord and into a relationship with Christ, they are souls for the kingdom. They, they are souls that can, will be saved in the kingdom of God. And that's the reason why the disciples and the apostles went out, not to not necessarily bring people to, to the church, which is which is good and, and necessary, but it it's there to so people can be saved, people can find salvation in Jesus. And one of the reasons why the churches aren't being blessed, and even our church, especially in the Western world, is not being blessed is because we're not walking in the fear of the Lord and his Ten Commandments anymore. So God has given us these laws for our good, not just rules and regulations. And in John 15, verse 10 and 11, Jesus says this, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So God has given us these laws for our good, not just for rules and regulations. And again, today, everyone is searching for true love, joy and peace. And again, if we follow God's Ten Commandments, we shall find them. And when we get to heaven... Is everybody going to be keeping God's Ten Commandments? Yes. When we get to heaven, is everybody going to have true love, joy, and peace? Yes. Okay. 
Now we saw people before were calling for the mountains to fall on them because of their fear of the Lord. Now, what will be the state of man's character or characters at that time? In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13, it says this, or 12, sorry, it says this. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So what will wax cold in people's hearts? Love. And what will that love lead to? Lead to? It will lead to iniquity abounding. Now, in Matthew 24, verse 10, it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. So this is going to be the state of society. And also, in First Timothy, of, of course, the world's going to be in a bad state, but in, in how bad will it be? Sorry, I'm just losing my place here. Second Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5 says this. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So that's going to be the state of society in the last days. What a horrible state of society this world will be in. Now, a point I want to bring out here is despises of those that are good. In other words, they will hate those who do good or keep the commandments of God. Now, when society gets to this state, the plea of David will be heard in Psalm 119 and verse 126, which says this. Oh, sorry. In Psalm 94, verse 20 to 21, it says this. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. So what's going to happen in the last days is they're actually going to frame laws to persecute and to, to kill and to condemn the righteous and condemn people who are doing good. That's how bad the world is going to get. Now, when the world gets to that stage, then we read this verse in Psalm 119. Sorry, I'll go to the next verse. Psalm 119 and verse 126, which says this, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. And what are they doing when they bring in these laws? This is what it says. They do violence to God's law. In other words, the laws they bring in are going to be laws that are against the law of God. And these laws, they will slay the widow and the stranger, murder the fatherless, but they say the Lord shall not see. See, in other words, they say that there is no fear of God before their eyes anymore. But what does God say? Understand ye British people among the people and ye fools. When will ye be wise? In other words, God is saying, wake up people. Shall he not hear? Shall God not see? Shall God not God know? Shall not God correct? Yes. Even though the fool says in his heart there is no God, there is a God. And one day, God is going to work against those who have made void his law. And at that time when that happens, the Bible says men's hearts will fail them for fear. So instead of having now the fear of God in their heart, that fear that led them, leads you to love God and keep his commandments, they now have a fear of what fear really is, the fear of afraid, the fear of something is going to happen. 
And it says here, men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So this God that they said there was no such thing of, this God that they, whose fear they put out of their lives, this God whose laws they despise, this God whose people they persecuted, this God is going to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And when he comes, when this happens, these wicked people's hearts are going to fail them for fear. And what are they going to do? God says, I create the fruit of the lips, saying, Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So God has been pleading and pleading and pleading to the wicked, to those who are far off from him, saying, I want to give you peace. I want to heal you. I want to give you rest. I want to give you my love. I want to give you my joy. I want to take away this fear. And I want you to be with me. I want to heal you. But they refuse. And then the peace that they wanted, they just cannot have. And then one day when Jesus comes back, they're going to realize what they've done. So, brothers and sisters, God wants us to have rest and peace. And one way we can do this is to fear God and to keep his Ten Commandments. But those who continue in sin and do not have in them the fear of the Lord, and those who continue to say that there is no God, will continue to wax worse and worse according to 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. And then they will more defiantly raise their fists in rebellion against God and oppress their fellow man more and more until the earth becomes so defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. This world will reach such a state. The Ten Commandments, and this causes the Lord to act against those that have made void his law. And then indeed will men's hearts fail them for fear. But like I said before, it won't be the true fear of the Lord. They will then fear God because they know the consequences are soon to come upon them because of their sins when Jesus returns. So, brothers and sisters, my question is, will you be one of those who, when Jesus comes back, will be hiding in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and in the caves of the earth because of your fear of the Lord and as a result of your disobedience to his laws? Say to them, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Or will you be one of those whom the Apostle Paul speaks of who love his appearing and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There will only be these two groups of people at the second coming of Jesus. And the question is, brothers and sisters, which group will you be in? And in conclusion, Solomon, the wisest man on earth apart from Jesus, said these in his final words in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so I pray, brothers and sisters, that we will be on the side 
the love the appearing of Jesus and we'll be saying, lo, this is our God. And it's my prayer that you will allow that fear of the Lord to translate or to mature into the love of the Lord so that you will indeed keep his commandments and you'll be glad when Jesus comes back. So thank you for listening to our message on Fear God today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, that you've revealed to us in the Bible what kind of God you really are, that you are a God of love, and what it really means to fear God. It's not to be afraid of you or terrified of you. It's not to think of you as an evil being ready to punish people for their sins, but it means to, to reverence you to understand the principles of your law in our heart so that we may represent your character in our lives, dear Father. We we realise, dear Lord, that we are in a fallen state in our humanity. And we realise, Father, that we cannot keep your law unless your spirit is in our heart as he writes those laws into our hearts, dear Lord. And by the grace, by your grace, that we may be enabled to to keep that law as Jesus did. We may say as Jesus did, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And how we will truly then delight to do thy law. And it will be our meditation day and night, dear Father. Because the fear of God or the fear that we have been talking about leads us to love you as we realize what you've done in giving us your son Jesus to die for us. And Father, so I pray that you'll help us by your grace to keep your law. Help us, Father, to, to understand the, the true principles of what it means to keep your law. And we will look at that in our next sermon. But Father, what it means to truly love you and, and keep your commandments. That we may be a blessing to others. This world needs love, it needs joy, and needs peace, dear Father. Many people are looking for this in their lives. And we can only receive it as we receive you and as we receive your law into our hearts and abide by those principles. So, Father, I pray by your grace that you'll help each and every one of us to truly un understand this and allow your spirit to do this marvellous work in our lives so we may represent your character to this world. So bless us now, I pray here, Heavenly Father, and I pray this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.